um, so I focus on the problem of monopoly and, uh, and market power in, in, in general. Uh, I, I, I'm not a, an academic. I am, uh, and I, I spend my time talking to business people and to political hacks. So this presentation is gonna be a little bit different and it's also gonna be more US centric because I, I focus on the US, although not entirely. Um, the, the basic premise of, uh, of my, my piece and a lot of the work that I do and the, the, the sort of the new anti-monopoly movement that's emerged over the last five to 10 years is that we have a monopoly crisis in the US and also globally. So over the last 20 years, 75% of industries have become more concentrated and there is concentrated power in every part of American commerce. So it's in, it's in big markets, you know, like cable, search, pharmaceuticals. The joke I sometimes offer, which even libertarians laugh at is, you know, if Reagan were alive today, he'd say the 10, nine most dangerous words in the English language are, I'm from Comcast and I'm here to help. Um, but it's not just in, in these large markets we all know of, it's also in things like tabletop games, missiles, munitions, just kind of like everywhere you go, there have been roll-ups in every part of our uh, commercial society. Monopolies do a lot of things. Economists have been studying it and also there's been a lot of journalism about it. They uh, generate wage inequality. They tend to undermine innovation, entrepreneurship, family businesses. They generate regional inequality when you have a capital pooling in a few gilded cities. They uh, damage democracy. They also tend to induce shortages, which is something that is uh, rife right now in our uh, political economy. Um, but I want to talk about something else that they do that's harder to measure, maybe impossible to measure, which is that a, a, a concentrated, unregulated monopolies, a society with concentrated corporate power, generates fear, frustration, and alienation within the citizenry. So last month, the Wall Street Journal, actually, yeah, Wall Street Journal published an article titled, Need to Call an Airline, Your Hold Time Will Be Approximately One Zillion Hours. So the, the article was about how airlines who received tens of billions of dollars from the taxpayer in return for keeping people employed still laid off their customer service teams. And now that there's been a return of, of air travel, the wait times are ridiculous. And I'm gonna read a little bit because I think it's important um, and really tells the story. So Cameron Wells, a 22 year old reality TV producer who needed help changing a flight from Los Angeles to Miami after the website kept crashing, used what he was told would be a 280 minute wait time with JetBlue to get through his to-do list. He began then finished an episode of Wii TV reality series, Love After Lockup, keeping the volume on his AirPods low in case an agent picked up early. He did two full cycles of laundry. He cooked some waffles and bacon. He washed the dishes. He packed for an unrelated trip the next day. He also set a timer for an hour and 45 minutes and went to sleep. When I woke from my nap, I was still on hold. So they go through a number of stories like this. One woman saying who, who was actually kept on, on hold for eight hours, she said, if I have to wait 45 minutes or something on the phone, that's nothing now. So you wanna talk about alienation from government bureaucracies. If you look at these private governments, which is sort of what a, a firm with market power is, you can see the alienation right now. Now we've all experienced something like this. When your phone company attaches a uh, small administrative charge to your bill, it's not worth fighting. When a hotel tax on a resort fee or a facilities fee to pill for a few extra dollars from your wallet, big tech has taken over the sinews of our information commons and controls our habits as information consumers. I mean, this, there's multiple stories in the Wall Street Journal. This just this week on Facebook, one just came out showing that Facebook knew that Instagram was leading teenage girls to eating disorders, but hid the research. And I think most people would say at best, one could hope for just an, uh, in, in terms of remedy an insincere apology from Mark Zuckerberg. Now economists have no measurement that I'm aware of for insults and petty indignities, but it's pretty clear that Americans are unhappy. I suspect this alienation is global, but uh, and, and particularly in, in developed societies with, with uh, similar political economies. But Americans are certainly unhappy. According to Gallup in 2021, just a quarter of Americans were satisfied with the size and influence of major corporations, and just 18% of them were satisfied with the moral and ethical climate of the country. These are substantial drops from last year and, and much lower than they were 20 years ago. And it's not just a consumer problem. I, I mentioned it, talked about problems that were affecting consumers largely. But we're increasingly unhappy at work, whether it's 
blue collar or white collar work. So let me start with the blue collar um, problem. And uh, this is something Michael talks a lot about. And I've learned a lot from him. In 2016, there was a viral video of executives firing workers at a carrier plant so that carrier could offshore production to Mexico. They make heating or heating units and, and uh, air conditioners. So the, the video actually became a factor in the presidential race. And if you haven't seen it, I urge you to watch it even five years later, because this kind of a this kind of phenomenon hasn't stopped. In it, a management consultant type of figure announces to the crowd of multiracial working class Americans that the factory will be closed. So I'm going to quote him. The best way to stay competitive is to move production from our facility in Indianapolis to Monterey, Mexico. And that's that's just standard. But I thought I thought what happened next was really interesting. So a chorus of boos rained down, which you would expect. People were upset. But instead of expressing sympathy, the consultant chided them. He said, I've got important information about the transition to share. If you don't want to hear it, other people do. Right? That's what he was, that's what he was doing. He wasn't just saying you're fired or that the firm that you work for, that you've worked for for, for many years, decades, some of them, thinks of you as a mere cog, as not a person, as less than human. It's also that you have to be insulted as you are laid off. Now, our response to these kinds of routine indignities is just to take it, or, or one response is just to take it, build up resentment. Donald Trump ran on resentment. But it's not just happening in the in the in the uh, blue collar world. In the white collar world, it's there as well. So, uh, in 2015, the New York Times did an expose of the white collar working environment at, at Amazon, which is a, a pace setter in our economy. Everybody wants to be like Amazon now. There's a book out called The Amazon Way, which is basically just how to turn your white collar environment into a sweatshop. And so this article talked about how Amazon is basically a sweatshop where employees are emailed after midnight about tasks and then immediately texted to find out why they haven't responded. And sobbing at the office is routine. You walk out of a conference room and you'll see a grown man covering his face, said one source. Nearly every person I worked with, I saw cry at their desk. So another natural response uh, to anger or frustration is to speak out, to organize, to build institutions through which one can project voice. And in the, in, the, uh, in the workplace, one traditional model since the Great Depression has been to form industrial unions. There have always been, uh, or there, throughout the 19th century, there were other ways of organizing labor. And one could argue there are different ways of organizing labor uh, as well, aside from industrial unions, but industrial unions is the main, um, most well-known way to do that. Uh, but workers, especially in low wage physical labor are generally too scared to do so. So in terms of big and unionization campaigns in 2019, the UAW lost a devastating campaign to, in Tennessee to organize a Volkswagen plant. Um, in 2021, Amazon crushed a unionization campaign at one of its warehouses in Alabama, and unions continue to weaken. So last year, the number of union members in the United States dropped by 300,000. Now, our legal system is so tilted in favor of capital that we've gone far beyond breaking unions towards constraining workers by contract. So roughly 30 million Americans have signed non-compete agreements, which prevents them from working for a rival employer. Many of them are at fast food restaurants or other low wage occupations. So this is not just scientists or engineers with trade secret information, even that's kind of nonsense. But this, we're talking about people at Jimmy John's and McDonald's. Employer power over labor is so extreme that one set of economists calculated it cuts overall output and employment by 13% and labor share of national output by 22%. Like these are big numbers, that's a lot. Now, finally, a third reaction to these kinds of indignities is to quit. And that is what is happening in force. Over 40% of American workers are looking for another job or planning to, according to the Society for Human Resources Management. Now, the quit rate this year, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, will be probably at a record high. But the data is incomplete because we don't measure in any credible way whether people think they are free. And I don't think it's actually possible to measure that. When discussing concepts like dignity, freedom, resentment, what I do is I tend to turn to the arts, the arts that I know. Um, so Office Space, the movie Office Space, is the greatest piece of political satire of the 21st century. It is a Mark Twain-esque send up of how we organize ourselves, basically rule by McKinsey management consultants. Now in that movie, the main character is a demoralized computer programmer who works at a software firm called Inatech. And he never really does any work. The main villains are two management consultants, 
both named Bob. The Bobs at Initech, uh, they are there on behalf of a cowardly boss who is both conflict averse and mean. And they're there to conduct mass layoffs to make the stock go up. Now, several scenes take place in a conference room as the Bobs are conducting interviews to find out who to fire. And in one scene, they're interviewing an employee and they ask his name. And I'm gonna go through this scene because I think it says something important. I also just love the scene. So they ask his name and he says, Michael Bolton. And the Bobs, these consultants, they get excited. Any relationship with the pop singer? No, 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 it's just a coincidence. And it's clear that the Bobs love Michael Bolton. They just love him. They think he's the greatest. And that this employee hates, just like hates him and just doesn't listen to him. He listens to hip hop or other, other types of music. But the Bobs just insist on saying, you've got to love it. They actually say, you, you, I admire his whole catalog, but I bet you must really love him given that you have the same name. And, if, and the employee has to sit there and take it uncomfortably. And he has to pretend that he likes Michael Bolton. But at the end of the scene, he says, actually, you can call me Mike. And both of the Bobs get like a dark look on their face. And in that moment, they decide to fire him. And you can just tell. Now, Office Space echoes the theme that the poet John Milton wrote about in the 1600s during the English Civil War, which is about the nature of liberty and power. Milton thought that place, placing concentrated power in the hands of an individual puts human beings in a state of bondage, which at that point was represented by the monarchy. All men naturally were born free, being the image of God, he wrote. Kings, especially absolutist kings, distorted this natural state, inducing, quote, the perpetual bowings and cringings of an abject people and forcing them to become sinful, to shape, quote, their noble words and actions heretofore so becoming the majesty of a free people into the base necessity of court flatteries and prostrations. Now, we don't have kings today, but if we did, a king might, for example, force a subject to pretend to like Michael Bolton's music to save his job and then fire him anyway. Now, Office Space is a classic film. It came out, I think, like 20 years ago, um, but it's still a classic film. People still use the sort of um, memes from Office Space all the time. Um, it touches on two aspects that have both become pervasive in our commercial society. The first is alienation and the second is fear. Both come from what I think is the main problem that we have in our political economy, which is the concentration of economic power in the hands of a few through the domination of markets. So we'll start with alienation. So an employee at a consumer product giant, Procter & Gamble, echoed David Graeber's theory of bullshit jobs when he wrote me. And I, I hear a lot from these people because my newsletter gets out into sort of the, the business world of, of people thinking about monopoly and workers and business people, consumers. But he wrote me, and I'm going to quote a couple of things. There, he was at Procter & Gamble at the time. He said, very few white collar workers at P&G really do anything. All I saw was a lot of bureaucratic box ticking and people patting themselves on the back for work that they hired consultants to do for them. P&G has dominant market power due in part to its merger in 2005 with Gillette and its resulting control over shelf space over retailers. It is so large that the guy's manager actually told him that he shouldn't really stress about any of his projects being successful because nothing that any of them did would even impact the firm. Now, the, the, this employee got disillusioned and he later went on to work in the tech industry. He told me that the firm that he was working for was growing and meeting customer needs with a good product on, on part, it was a parking app and it was a useful, profitable product. But then they were pushed by venture capitalists to get higher returns or to quote unquote pivot. And he said, we are now exclusively focused on getting acquired by a big tech firm. We're, we're no longer building a company. We're not even building a product. We're building a feature that we hope will end up getting included in an app owned by a mega corporation who will buy them. And all of his friends were experiencing the same thing. So that's alienation. And then after alienation, there is fear. So here's a quote from a Congressman, David Cicilline, in 2019 about the power of large tech firms. And he did a, an investigation into big tech firms. And what he found is that most firms, most business people wouldn't go on the record. They were scared. It is far too common to hear horror stories from startups and other small businesses about how a dominant platform's abrupt algorithm changes have destroyed their business. So um, he was talking about companies like Amazon who have under their control the fate of hundreds of thousands of independent businesses. I know anybody who's wrote, written a book knows that you know, Amazon has a lot of control. Um, but you hear this kind of sentiment all the time. I hear it from business people in every walk of life. Um, 
people in franchising, construction, business software, office supplies, syringes, beer distribution, whatever. The fear is pervasive. In fact, I was doing reporting on a cheerleading monopoly. And yes, there is a cheerleading monopoly. It's a firm called Varsity Brands owned by Bain Capital, which controls most of the major cheer competitions. Almost everyone in, involved that I talked to was afraid to speak to me using their name. So one person said, and they were used like really ominous tones, you have no idea, idea how deep this goes. And I'm like, it's cheerleading. Like this is, this is not the CIA, but that's how everyone in business feels these days, unable to speak. And we are seeing, I think as Milton noted, the perpetual bowings and cringings of an abject people. So it wasn't always like this. Milton, among others, many known as the Levelers, handed down a tradition, it ultimately became a Republican tradition, that formed the ideals of liberty in America, the idea that men would be able to live free from domination by aristocracy and secure the fruits of their own labor. So I have a, I'm going to kind of go through a couple, of, um, a couple of quotes. America is a land of labor. That was Benjamin Franklin in 1784. Labor is superior to capital and deserves much the higher consideration. That was Abraham Lincoln in 1861, quoted by Teddy Roosevelt 50 years later. Woodrow Wilson in Facing Down the Robber Baron said, America was created to break every kind of monopoly, to set men free upon a footing of equality, upon a footing of opportunity to match their brains and their energy. There are two main bodies of law to protect the American business person, consumer and worker, from fear and coercion in commerce. The first is labor law, which has been amply covered by Michael. But the second is competition law, of which antitrust is a part. These laws are tools meant to deal with fundamentally domination, the dependence of one business person's existence or success on another's will. In 1950, Emanuel Seller, a congressman who ran the same anti-monopoly committee that investigated big tech said the following, under our ancient common law, your neighbor must not point a gun at you, even though he has never shot anyone. Similarly, our antitrust laws were intended to protect businessmen not only from violence, but from fear of violence. Now, Seller was reflecting the consensus of time, which is that policymakers should seek a union dense, high wage, high productivity economy with significant small businesses and new business entrants. Americans understood that without economic liberty, which meant freedom from arbitrary and coercive power in commerce, there can be no political liberty. So what happened, let's go back hundreds of years on this, but what happened to the low point that we're at today? I think the similar transition that, that several have, have talked about um, in the 1970s was an ideological transition, a revolution. And it was confusing because it happened on both the right and the left, but two different groups of intellectuals redefined America as a land not of citizens, but of consumers. And part of this shift was about dealing with inflation of that era and making, um, uh, and making the case that policymakers should focus only on efficiency as determined by low consumer prices. So there we go with that efficiency principle again. But it was also an ideological revolution. So you had um, conservatives who argued that big firms were big because they were efficient, that policymakers should never interfere in their business practices. So that's on the, on the right, they largely developed the tool set that is still in use today across competition policy. But there were leftists um, you know, who, who created this narrative of, of inevitabilism. So John Kenneth Galbraith is, is a key one. And he argued that there that really is no choice. There is no ability for man to determine his economic system, whether through democracy or authoritarian system or, or whatever. So he wrote, um, Actually, democracy is something of an illusion. The Soviet Union in America had similar economic systems. Quote, it is part of the vanity of modern man that he can decide the character of his economic system. Man's area of decision, in fact, is vanishingly small. So stuff just happens in the economy. That's not, we can't do anything about it. Now, before these movements emerged, policymakers did a, did a number of things to prevent domination. But such notions were tossed out as outdated, as, as inefficient. So as, as one uh, congressman put it in 1976, this guy is very liberal, Pete Stark, the populism of the 1930s doesn't really apply to the 1970s. Now, um, the two groups took over both parties, influenced Congress, antitrust enforcers, and naive new consumer rights groups and political leaders were persuaded by the legal establishment that laws to support workers, small businesses, while disfavoring big business, um, was simply protectionist rackets to help special interests. So distinguishing between big and small, 
became foolish, concentrations of market power descended into largely the realm of myth. Now, these are the people that wouldn't think of committing discrimination in a sociological context, and that would horrify them, said a small business advocate. But in the economic context, it becomes the thing to do. So in academia, in the halls of power, the boardroom, and labor unions, in the trade association world, the pro-monopoly side won. By the late 1970s, the intellectual debate was over. A scholar pronounced antitrust a totally non-ideological field. It became technical, a law to be used only by economists and experts, not people who work for a living. It became a science. So from the 1980s onward, corporations consolidated in every area of commerce, manufacturing, agriculture, media, banks, chain stores, technology, telecommunications, defense. It started under Reagan, but it came from both parties. Bill Clinton expanded it. Um, and he actually finally removed anti-monopoly uh, arguments from the Democratic platform in 1992. It had been in the Democratic platform since 1880. It was also often in the Republican platform as well. It was under Clinton's tenure that Walmart finally had a store in every state and overtook GM as the top employer in the US. And this pro-monopoly, pro-finance policy architecture has continued to this day. Now, in short, the reason we feel this fear and alienation, this resentment, is due to policy. Starting four decades ago, policymakers and Americans forgot about the threat of monopolies to our liberty, about concentrations of power, and forgot how to use competition laws. As a result, in many ways, we lost our freedom. Wealth and power have flowed into the hands of monopolists in every industry, whether pharmacy benefits managers, meat packers, group purchasing organizations, app store monopolists, firms like Google. We are increasingly ruled by human resources divisions or customer service hold time algorithms or arbitrary hospital billing departments or distant faraway bosses who hire management consultants to give us bad news. Or we are part of that managerial elite of ass kissers bowing and cringing and pretending to like Michael Bolton. Now, I think slowly, I think we're, we're sort of starting to wake from this monstrous experiment in illiberalism. The reality of our capital heavy economic order keeps intruding into our politics, whether it be financial crises, bad behavior by tech firms or monopolistic industries like semiconductors, railroads or ocean shipping, inducing supply chain shortages, which are now everywhere and people are noticing. Antitrust has become an increasing part of politics with members on the both left and right trying to figure out how to slot it into a political agenda. I think similar to, to kind of labor law, everyone's like, well, there's something wrong with how workers are treated, but we're not totally sure what to do about it. Um, the Trump administration challenged Google. They filed a suit to break it up. Biden and Facebook as well. Biden administration is continuing those suits and has gone further, having a, a whole of government approach, not just on behalf of taking on uh, corporations in product markets, but also in labor markets. So it's a, it's a, it's a pro-labor agenda as well. Anyway, so I'll just stop there. I'll just note that, that what we're seeing is a kind of fit. Uh, I think we're in a kind of a moment of transition. The, mo the public, at least in the US, but I think this is probably global, although it's more intense in the US. It's pretty alienated. Uh, people are afraid, but uh, they are uh, angry and they aren't gonna remain alienated and afraid. And, for much longer. Now, where that goes, it could go in many directions, but that is a subterranean tension that is happening in our culture, that fear and alienation in our commercial society. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Uh, well, again, I suspect I'm not alone in having, having thoughts, uh, questions or comments to share, so I will, I will uh, defer to the rest of you and uh, Look forward to the, the ensuing. You have to, if you have a comment, you have to say whether you saw Office Space. Oh, I've seen Office Space many times. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great movie. Although I'm happy to, maybe I should just proceed and let everyone else gather thoughts. Uh, okay. So let me let me pose a a question quickly, Matt, specifically about. Um, the tech industry, which is, you know, it seems as though this is this is in a way the tip of the spear at the moment for the sort of growing bipartisan consensus. It seems like that on, on the need for for sort of greater regulation, as you as you say, it's you know uh, spanning now two two presidential administrations are are seeking to take action against uh, these firms, and you know an ongoing question for me about the, some of the tech companies at least is whether the right way to think about them is. Uh, 
about about what's gone wrong is whether they are um, whether they are properly speaking private actors that are which are behaving badly or whether they are uh, something like a natural uh, utility like they're, whether they're really a public utility in some cases which has been sort of wrongly privatized uh, and the reason I and the, the question I suppose for me is is in connection is particularly with with um, company like um, Twitter or Facebook say but also Google in a different way you know there are substantial network effects um, which play an important role in the in the, the services that these companies deliver you know in, in a way so it's 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 not as though you could break Twitter up into 15 different pieces and have have a company which was have, have 15 companies that were worth one fifteenth as much as Twitter, right? And the same is true for Google, I think, because of the the way its algorithms work. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm I don't know if you have any views about this, but I mean, what, what's the right way to think about this from your your view in terms of the the what specifically is going wrong, you know, uh, and the 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 kinds of uh, leverage that these companies have over their respective markets, and what's the right way to correct that 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 uh, that m misfit. Yeah, uh, so those are that's a that's a good question. There's a lot of embedded parts of that. I, I just want to highlight one thing since to, to try to connect Google and Facebook to some of the earlier uh, comments. You know, these these are these are um, these firms are challenging fundamental notions of sovereignty. Uh, they are transnational. You've never seen anything like this. Um, so it's it's uh, it's bipartisan in the U.S., but the challenge is is global. And there's a there's a really interesting kind of anti-monopoly tacit network that's happening all over the world. Like um, South Korea passed a prohibition on app on certain practices on, on Apple and Google's app store, which is also a bill that's been floated in a number of US states and is, is floated in, in a, a number of countries. And people are kind of learning from each other. It's the same network of people who are working uh, on these, um, uh, on these data and privacy and market power questions, so there's there's there are interesting questions of 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 how to handle firms like this, um, both in terms of their impact globally, uh, and they are having the similar impacts I think everywhere, and also how the political systems are responding. To your question about you know whether these are public utilities, I think it's a it depends on the firm and it depends on the the line of business of that firm. So I think there's a general uh, there's a general assumption that we have economies of scale in our industrial systems, and that means that that you know you can't like have a family run steel plant right or a family run telephone network. It just does, sort of doesn't make any, any sense. There are um, there are you know if you break broke up a railroad network into you know you just chopped it up, it wouldn't necessarily work as well. Um, or may not work at all, but I, there, there are, there's another. Um, but when you get into economies of scale, there's this, there's this thing that happens where um, people confuse legal arrangements, which just create legal size, with actual technical or operational e e economies of scale. So, so as an example, you know, Facebook, right? The network, the Facebook Blue product, might have some economies of scale embedded in, in that product itself. I would actually dispute that, but you could say that it does. But Instagram, um, and they, Instagram might have some economies of scale there, but there's no reason to have them in the same legal corporation, except that there's just a, a set of contracts and papers that say that, that they, that they should be similar, like YouTube and Google, like Google has nine products with more than a billion users. You could separate it out in nine companies, which would still each have a billion users. That's you know scale. Um, another, I think, and this gets to sort of a larger question, which is the idea of scale of, of scale and scale having to be captured in into one legal entity aren't the same thing. So, um, if you look at the most scaled network system of all time, it would be the internet, right? And no company owns the internet. Bob Rubin, who was Bill Clinton's Treasury Secretary, when he was first shown uh, a browser. I think it was the Mosaic browser. He like looked at the internet. He said, who owns this? And they were like, nobody. And he just like couldn't believe it, right? And that's because there are, you can bake, you know, you can bake standards into products um, like email. Email, no one owns it. Social networking could work like email, 
but we just haven't done the standardization. So in many ways, a lot of the questions about, about, um, about scale are not about, like there are economies of scale, but you have to distinguish that from whether, from the political question of how to actually encapsulate that, that technology, who gets to use that technology. And we've, we've confused economies of scale with the ability of you know, a Mark Zuckerberg to deploy a certain type of technology through certain lines of business. In terms of, if you do have network systems, you can do things like interoperability. You can, in some cases, break them up. You can also choose to do things like public utility rules. And typically, you'd have to do, uh, you'd have to do sort of all three of them, um, if that if that makes sense. Uh, I'll ask a hopefully sort of formed question um, that actually gets back to some of, I want to ask it in the Michael segment too. So um, I like uh, hearing about economic liberty for laborers, <laughs> you know, up against a concentration of capitalist power um, or corporate power. Um, we don't, I think, often hear about economic liberty in that way, but I think you're uh, right to say that it's a, a more kind of older American principle. Um, you know, we usually have here in terms of uh, um, tax policy freeing, you know, freeing the, the wealthy from, from taxes, et cetera. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is um, it, American Compass just came out with this study that maybe some of you saw a report where they looked at um, why or why not people wanted to join uh, unions. I'm not sure how many of you saw this. Um, and really the vast, uh, what they found is that a vast majority of, um, of folks said they, they didn't like being in a union or they didn't want to be in a union because of the political nature of unions. Um, and so what I'm curious about is, you know, our unions have be, unions become more, unions have always been obviously politicized and, and doing political lobbying and that kind of thing. But our, um, our unions kind of to Michael's point, are they, are they uh, less involved in kind of collective, the kind of traditional collective bargaining for workers and more involved in lobbying for welfare policy that then passes on to the taxpayer in terms of higher taxes for the middle class or the workers um, because they're kind of worried about the employer just going offshore um, and then leaving them without jobs. So that's kind of a question for Michael. And then on the other side, like what's the way in which you can employ antitrust law to such an extent that will really end up benefiting the laborer. Um, I guess I'd want to hear more about the nuts and bolts of um, how it is that you get smaller and smaller, um, you know, corporations, so that then the that the laborer is actually benefited by antitrust law. Obviously, you made the great case, and it was very entertaining too, about sort of the alienation um, that takes place with just these monoliths. And I'm, you know, more and more convinced that I shouldn't be buying from Amazon at all. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I guess I'd want to hear from both of you about sort of how do we, I mean, and this is really what in, in part the whole, the whole seminar is about, webinar is about, like, how do we really, how can we use these two um, uh, sort of um, parts of law to, to, help, um, to help the worker? Well, I'll speak uh, briefly. I don't want to take up uh, too much of Matt's time. Uh, the trade union movement was deliberately apolitical for much of its history under Samuel Gompers. They, did, they wanted their distance from both parties. Uh, and as recently as the 50s and 60s, both Republicans and Democrats uh, competed for the trade union vote. Uh, what has happened is first, private sector trade unions have almost entirely become extinct. The public sector trade unions are nearly 100% democratic and that's just their members. Uh, and they've become a major source of funding for the Democratic Party, not of votes through most of the country, but providing money. So, uh, so I think in that sense, they, they really seem to be kind of a wing of the Democratic Party uh, rather than trade unions in, in a sense that Gompers would have recognized. And also Gompers and uh, a lot of uh, private sector trade union leaders, uh, as well as President Franklin Roosevelt were opposed to uh, the unionization of uh, government officials, or if they were unionized, of, of allowing them to strike. It was illegal for uh, oh. uh, even unionized government officials to strike civil servants until John F. Kennedy changed that with a, a, an order. 
Uh, and the reason was, as the labor union leaders explained it, uh, private sector unions uh, negotiate with the firm to distribute the profits from sales to consumers. Public sector unions are taking money from one part of the working class in the private sector and giving it to other members of the, the working class in the public sector. So that, that was, you know, the, the, there's an older wing of labor unionism in the US that is both anti-partisan and skeptical about government unions. Yeah, and just um, to, to build off that, you know, that Sam Gompers and the AFL were, they, they won an ideological fight in the 19th century against Terence Powderly and the Knights of Labor who had a, who had a much broader view of, uh, of how to, they basically didn't accept industrialization as it was occurring and rejected the idea of, of wage labor, their kind of their version of a managerial class. And they were a broad national movement, but ultimately lost, uh, lost out to, to Gompers and the, the AFL. So there are earlier kind of more, um, there, there are earlier traditions that took the uh, small R Republican tradition and tried to make it, make it uh, owned by the, the working class, which had success in some ways. Um, uh, there's a very good book by Alex Gurevich on this. Uh, so the, to answer your, your first question on kind of how does antitrust affect kind of labor? Um, so there's, there are, there's a specific, like there's the technical details, right? You can actually bring antitrust cases on labor grounds, right? If a hospital controls the level of, of, um, uh, of wage, the wages of nurses, right? They, in a city, you could bring a case on that. Um, traditionally, uh, you know, because of the collapse of antitrust, product markets, it, there, there's, it's very hard to bring a case period, but there really is not a big tradition of doing that because we uh, tended to set up labor law as the thing that was supposed to help workers. Although there was, there's always been some um, antitrust in, in uh, labor, particularly in sports. You saw with, with um, the NCAA um, and the Supreme Court just ruled on that, but that goes back, you know, you, you see decades. Um, but I think that there's a broader answer to the question of competition policy, which isn't just antitrust, uh, but has to do with all, all sorts of financial regulatory policy as well, um, and labor. And the way that, you know, the way, one way to think about it would be that what happened in the, in the 1970s and 80s was that, you know, the, there was this wholesale attack on, on labor unions, right? We all know about that. That was what Reagan did with the air traffic controller strike. It was, I think, supported by, in some ways, by by both parties and the and the public itself. Um, not, not totally clear uh, about that, but like generally speaking, uh, we all know about the attack on on labor. The other attack, though, was to get rid of the restraints on capital. So one way to think of antitrust is it's a restraint on capital. Um, if you have ten steel mills or 10 auto plants, right? It, you might see an economy of scale with each of those. Like you wanna have a big auto plant, but there's no necessarily economy of scale of putting all 10 of them into one legal entity, right? What you get when you're able to do that is you get more bargaining power against suppliers. You get more bargaining power against workers. That's why you know a firm like Walmart did so well. They were good at what they did, but it was legal changes that allowed them to accumulate market power and get superior bargaining against suppliers and workers that let them uh, have such explosive growth. So generally speaking, what you want to, the, if you want to empower kind of the little guy, the, the worker, what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna both give uh, workers opportunities to organize themselves and empower themselves and at the same time as you want to disrupt the ability of capital to come together and collude to atomize, to atomize people. So it's not just industrial units. There are a lot of ways that we facilitated uh, workers and people who work for a living and small businesses who kind of fit in between worker and, and, and capital, but tend to have traditionally sat more on the side of labor. Um, this is another change that happened in the seventies. Um, some of these include uh, co-ops, the government 
facilitating co-ops. Uh, patents, patents were a protection for engineers, right? And, and they, they've been inverted to become a weapon for the monopolist and the financier, but they were a way that engineers could protect themselves against their employer or their, the, the monopolist or a financier. Copyright is another, was another tool. Copyright was a way to protect the artist or the writer from the, the monopolist, from the banker. It's been inverted, but it was, you could look at it as a labor protection. Another one would be agricultural price supports, which have, of course, a checkered history, but agricultural price supports, um, uh, supply management, things like that were, you know, you could look at them as protecting a sm the small farm and, um, uh, and, and that's a way of protecting people who work in the, in the agricultural sector. So the industrial union model doesn't necessarily fit for every kind of sector. There are different institutional arrangements that you can make to let people come together. Occupational licensing is another one you can have. That's another mechanism for people to come together and actually organize themselves um, through, their, through, their, uh, through their government. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do it, but I think just the, the, the general approach is you need to shatter and, and break up the ability of capital to collude. And I guess I'll just sort of note that, you know, when firms are big enough, right, and you can go back to the Homestead strike, right, which is Andrew Carnegie was able to break the, you know, they were one of the strongest um, uh, setters of labor power. And then Andrew Carnegie was able to break the steel workers at Homestead because he owned a bunch of other steel plants. So he could run his company, still make money, and basically subsidize the, the breaking of a strike. If he only owned a single plant, he couldn't have done that. And that's kind of what you see in general. Like, you know, um, when firms get so big and when firms get really big and powerful, a work stoppage in one area or even in multiple areas doesn't really matter because they just have the financial resources or operational resources to, to keep going elsewhere. So you need to shrink the power of capital. You need to shatter that power break them up so that they are focused on operations and so that workers and, and people who do the work actually have some leverage. Well, it is 3.38 and I'm mindful that we said we would stop at, at 3.30. Certainly want to be respectful of the uh, time of all of our uh, uh, panelists uh, among others and, and don't want to be too taxing on the, the attention of our participants as well. So perhaps uh, this is a good a good place to wrap up. Um, but to start by expressing my very sincere gratitude to uh, to Russ and Lori and Michael and Matt for stimulating presentations and to um, uh, you know the whole panel for for lively discussion all throughout. Um, and I might just say by way of summary, I mean this is this is by no means captures everything that we discussed, but it does seem to me that you know looking back, in a way, what we've had are four different approaches to, uh, to elucidating the, the, the enmity uh, between what Belloc called the servile state, uh, which Michael rightly reminded us of, and uh, other corporate persons, um, the family, the church, uh, the union, among others. And this is, you know, in a way, the, fun the fundamental question, I think, um, of political economy that we're we're wrestling with today, um, you know, we've in, in a way both left and right liberalism have gotten the terms of the debate wrong from the start by framing it too much as a as a contest between individual and 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 state power. Um, and what we need to do is is reintroduce a, a thicker and more complicated uh, picture of the terrain. Uh, it's, it's more densely populated than we had thought and. Uh, and you've all done a really lovely job in, in, in different ways of, of highlighting uh, various dimensions of this of this problem. Uh, and I, I do hope, uh, as I mentioned before, that we will uh, shortly gather the full versions of, of each of these papers with a, a proper introduction and perhaps responses or something like that, uh, and a, a sort of symposium to be to be published somewhere. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, and. Uh, and for the panelists, also, you know, uh, do do uh, stay tuned for an email from uh, Danilo and or me shortly about other matters, you know, uh, to uh, uh, to wrap up. 
And yeah, just a brief ahead. note, uh, Brendan, I'll let you close in a second. Uh, first of all, yes, gratitude to all, of course, including our uh, live viewers. I think we had about 28 or 30 or something like that consistently here. And of course, we have it recorded. But also, I, I misspoke. So Russ Hittinger will actually uh, not be giving a public lecture next month. Uh, it will be, we'll have Russ back, um, I guess, uh, uh, some, some other year. It will be a uh, uh, so I misspoke that uh, at, the, at, the, at the beginning about that. And also I wanted to uh, introduce Erica Bakioki properly. Erica is also uh, not just the senior fellow at Abigail Adams Institute, but also a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a lawyer, mother of seven, and an author of this book I mentioned, The Rights of Women. She'll be giving our annual public lecture on Tuesday at Harvard. So, and I think we'll be live streaming that too. So, um, Keep an eye on that. And again, Brendan, thank you uh, to you as well for being um, the initiator, the organizer uh, of this uh, wonderful event. Thank you. Oh, hardly. Yeah. No, thank, thank you as well, Danella, yeah, and, and all of you for your, your participation. But uh, well, yeah, with that, that being said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop the recording now and, we, and then we'll jump off the call uh, shortly. So thanks again, and, uh, and we'll talk to you soon.